Welcome to the Lowy Institute. I'm Michael Fullylove, the Executive Director of the Institute, and I'm delighted to welcome you to this evening's event with the Secretary-General of NATO, Jens Stoltenberg. I acknowledge that we're gathered on the land of the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation, and I pay my respects to their elders, past and present. I also want to acknowledge the Institute board members here tonight, Stephen Lowy and Glenn Stevens, as well as the other Institute members and supporters in the room. I want to welcome everyone back to the Institute's historic headquarters and our spiritual home at 31 Bly Street. It's wonderful to return to this magnificent sandstone building after four years down the road at 1 Bly Street. And I'd like to take this opportunity to acknowledge the generosity of the Lowy family in completely renovating this building. It's an extraordinary gift to the Institute and to Sydney and to Australia. And I'd like to thank my chairman, Sir Frank Lowy, Stephen Lowy and the rest of the Lowy family. Before I introduce Mr Stoltenberg, I want to make an admission and I want to record that speeches by NATO Secretaries General have played an important role in my life. In fact, I met my wife Gillian at a speech by a Secretary General of NATO. 20 years ago, I attended a speech by Javier Solana at Oxford University, where I was studying, and my eyes fet, fell on a very beautiful woman. And just as I looked at her across the room, she looked at me and she gave me a big smile. I never met her that night, but I met her subsequently, and one thing led to another. Much later, we were having a candlelit dinner, and I looked across and I said, darling, the moment our eyes met at that NATO speech, I knew this was something special. <laughs> and Gillian looked very confused. She looked at me and she said, were you at that speech? <laughs> so, Secretary General, NATO speeches have a magical reputation in our household. I don't want to raise the expectations for your performance tonight, but uh, so far they've been important. Ladies and gentlemen, the North Atlantic Treaty Organisation is one of the most important and successful military alliances in history. NATO turned 70 in April, and like all 70-year-olds, it is finding it has to adapt to its changed circumstances. And over the past decade, NATO has encountered a string of challenges, both from without and within the alliance. In 2014, Russia annexed Crimea, and five years later, the Russian flag still flies over Simferopol. There is a frozen conflict in Ukraine's east. There is pressure on NATO's Baltic members. Further east, NATO personnel continue to train and support Afghan troops. NATO has also faced challenges from within the alliance, including the election of a president of the United States who is a skeptic of alliances. So it's a lot to deal with. And since 2014, NATO has been led by Jens Stoltenberg. He is the Alliance's chief civil servant. He is responsible for coordinating its workings, leading NATO's international staff, chairing many of its major committees and acting as its spokesman. Mr Stoltenberg twice served as Prime Minister of Norway, first from 2000 to 2001, and then from 2005 to 2013. And in office, he championed increased defence spending and tackling climate change, a dual orientation that I applaud. Let me tell you how this evening will work. First, Mr Stoltenberg will come and speak to us for about 10 or 15 minutes, and then I will come back to have a conversation with him and to chair a question and answer session with him. So, ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming the Secretary-General of NATO, Jens Stoltenberg. Thank you so much for that uh, kind introduction, uh, Dr. Fulilov, and uh, I cannot promise you the same kind of magic speech as the last time you listened to a Secretary General of NATO, and I cannot promise that anyone will meet their, their future spouse uh, in this, uh, uh, during this evening, but uh, I can promise you that I will say some words about NATO, and I will be quite uh, brief in my introduction, uh, and then I will be happy to sit down and to answer your questions. Uh, let me also thank the uh, Lowy Institute for hosting us all uh, uh, today. It is a great honour and pleasure for me to have this opportunity to meet with you and uh, to be back in Australia. It's, uh, it's great for me to be here. Uh, the, I was here in 2011, then in the capacity as Norwegian Prime Minister. 
Uh, this is the first time I'm in uh, Australia as uh, Secretary General of uh, uh, NATO. And we may be oceans apart. Uh, it's a long distance from uh, Brussels, the NATO headquarters, uh, to Sydney and to Australia. Uh, uh, but we are the closest of uh, partners. And uh, the close partnership between uh, NATO and uh, Australia uh, is of great, in, great importance, uh, but uh, I'm absolutely certain that the importance, uh, the value of that uh, partnership uh, uh, just have to increase because we uh, face uh, more and more global uh, challenges uh, which we can only be able to address and face if we work together. And uh, 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 the, the shared challenges uh, we face brings us actually closer together. We work side by side, uh, NATO and Australia, uh, fighting terrorism uh, in Afghanistan and Iraq. Uh, we are uh, together uh, supporting partners like uh, Ukraine and we are uh, standing up uh, for the international rules-based order, NATO and Australia together. Uh, this afternoon, I signed uh, with Defence Minister Reynolds a renewed partnership agreement between Australia and NATO. This will deepen our cooperation and strengthen our ability to work together even further. It was also a privilege uh, to meet some of the incredible women and men serving in the Royal Australian Navy uh, aboard HMSMAS Hobart. Uh, we were actually uh, visited the, the ship at, uh, at the naval base here in uh, Sydney. Wherever I go, uh, whenever I meet members of the Australian Defence Force, I'm impressed uh, by their dedication and professionalism. So I'm proud that Australia and NATO are deepening our cooperation. And we will need that cooperation even more in the future because security challenges are becoming increasingly global. And let me mention three of them. First, increasing great power competition. This puts our global system and values under pressure. From Crimea uh, to North Korea and from Syria to, South China, to the South China Sea. Just a few days ago, uh, Russia's disregard for rules uh, and norms led to the demise of one of the great pillars of the post-Cold War arms control regime, the Intermediate Range Nuclear Forces Treaty. For over three decades, and this treaty eliminated an entire category uh, of weapons which threatened European security. Unfortunately, Russia has deployed a new missile system, the SSC-8, uh, which violates the treaty. The new Russian uh, missiles are mobile, hard to detect, reduce warning time to minutes, and lower the threshold uh, for the use of nuclear weapons in armed conflict. This makes the world less safe for us all. NATO remains committed to effective arms control, disarmament and non-proliferation and to keeping uh, our people safe. In recent years, uh, Russia has demonstrated a pattern of destabilizing behavior. It has illegally annexed Crimea, continues to destabilize eastern Ukraine and has attempted to interfere in domestic political processes in NATO countries. Australia has shown strong support in calling out Russia's unacceptable actions and in promoting the rules-based order. China's role and influence, influence is another sign of increasing global uh, power competition. Its economic rise and technological prowess is powering global growth. This brings many opportunities, financially and politically. But China's rise also has implications for the global rules-based order and for our security. 
We see this in the South China Sea, in cyberspace, and in Chinese investments in critical infrastructure. So we need uh, to better understand the challenges and the opportunities China uh, presents. Second, international terrorism is another challenge we have to confront together, NATO and Australia. That is why we are in Afghanistan. NATO allies and partners like Australia are working side by side. Together, uh, we work to ensure Afghanistan never again becomes a safe haven for international terrorism. And we help the Afghans create the conditions for peace. We are now cl closer to um, a peace deal in Afghanistan than we have been ever before. And we strongly support efforts to achieve a negotiated settlement to the conflict. NATO and Australia uh, are also both members of the Global Coalition to Defeat ISIS, where we have made enormous progress. We have liberated territory the size of the United Kingdom and freed millions uh, from oppression. So now um, ISIS uh, no longer controls any territory in Iraq and Syria. Australia is playing a key role by training local forces in Iraq, uh, complementing the efforts of NATO's new training mission in uh, the country. We strongly believe that prevention is better than intervention, and in the long run, training local forces is one of the best weapons we have in the fight against terrorism. A third uh, global challenge we have to face together is cyber. Cyber challenges know no boundaries, boundaries and no borders. They cannot be overcome by one nation alone. And cyber is fundamentally changing the nature of conflict. NATO is adapting. We protect our own networks from cyber attacks. We have rapid response teams available on 24-7 uh, uh, standby that can help NATO countries under attack. And we are setting up a cyberspace operation center at our headquarters in Mons. We are also uh, sharing information real time about cyber threats uh, with members uh, and partners, including with the European uh, Union. And we hope to uh, step up our cyber cooperation with Australia in the future. That was actually one of the issues I discussed both with the uh, uh, Prime Minister, the Defence Minister and the Foreign Minister this uh, morning. So, ladies and gentlemen, Australia and NATO are stronger together when it comes to defending our shared values freedom, democracy and human rights. Respect for global rules and institutions which have helped keep us safe for 70 years. Today the world is becoming more complex and more contested. So whether great power competition, international terrorism or threats from cyberspace, we are always stronger and safer when we work together. And NATO is grateful to have a reliable partner and friend in Australia. Thank you so much, and then I'm ready for your questions. Well, Secretary General, thank you for that. I'm going to ask you three or four questions, and then I'm going to go to the audience. So let me say to my colleagues that you have an opportunity to ask the Secretary General of NATO a question. So, Start to think of a good one, and I'll come to you soon. Um, let me ask you, Mr Stoltenberg, about uh, some of the world leaders that you mentioned or perhaps you didn't mention, and, uh, but, but we talk about a lot at the Lowy Institute. And let me start with the United States, because the United States is in the cockpit of the liberal international order. Um, now, Mr. in Mr Trump's early months in office, he caused alarm in a lot of NATO capitals because he seemed reluctant to affirm Article 5 of the, of the North Atlantic Treaty, the Mutual Defence Clause. He did reluctantly, or he did belatedly endorse it, and of course he subsequently said that he's a big fan of NATO. 
Um, but you've dealt a lot with the president. What's your observation of how he approaches alliances, how he thinks about the principle you ended with, which is that we are stronger when we work together? I think we have to remember that NATO is an alliance of 29 democracies, uh, meaning that uh, we have governments, presidents, prime ministers representing different political parties. We are coming from different cultures, uh, we have different history, different uh, uh, he, uh, political uh, traditions, uh, we have different parties in government, we are coming from the both, both sides of the Atlantic. So there are differences between NATO allies and sometimes also real disagreements and, uh, and therefore uh, uh, there is no way to, to hide or actually, actually I'm not trying to hide that uh, there are disagreements also inside the family. And, and, and some allies disagree with President Trump, and President Trump disagree with uh, some allies. Uh, the strength of NATO and President Trump is representing that, is that despite differences, uh, we, have been all, we have always been able to unite around our core task, and that is to protect and defend each other. And, 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 and President Trump is committed to NATO. As, as you said, he told me, and not only told me, he said at the press conference that he, was a, he is a big fan of NATO. And uh, he has, at the same time, of course, expressed very clearly that he uh, strongly believes that we need fair burden sharing in the lines. Meaning that it's unfair that uh, the United States, which has a GDP, uh, uh, the same size as the GDP of uh, the European uh, NATO allies and Canada, uh, but the United States pays around three times as much uh, uh, for defense than uh, the other allies uh, uh, do. That's not fair. That's not fair burden sharing. Uh, uh, so he has been very clear, he has a very much as a direct way of communicating that, that uh, this has to change. Um, uh, uh, I agree with him, uh, but even more important, 29 allies or 28 other allies agree with the United States. Uh, and, uh, and this is a message not only communicated clearly from President Trump, but, uh, but also from the former President Obama. And it was back in 2014 and where we made the decision that we needed fair burden sharing, that those allies who are spending less than 2% uh, of GDP on defense have to increase defense spending. The good news is that uh, after years of reducing defense budgets, all allies have now started to increase defense spending. More allies meet the 2% uh, guideline, and the majority of NATO allies have put forward plans to reach the 2% uh, goal within a decade, which uh, within 2024, which was what we decided. So, so, uh, uh, yeah. so, so if you ask me whether the uh, United States and President Trump is committed to, to, to NATO, the answer is yes, uh, but they want uh, uh, NATO allies to, to have a more, uh, so, fair burden sharing, that we share the burden in a more fairly way. And the good news is that we are uh, uh, on track to doing exactly that. And should we give President Trump some credit for that? I mean, is there a sense in which by putting the issue of burden sharing so directly on the agenda, he's energised other, other NATO capitals? Uh, so I, I strongly believe that uh, the uh, strong message from President Trump is having an impact on defence spending. Uh, and again, it's possible to disagree on issues as climate change or trade, but agree on the main issue for NATO, and that is uh, that we protect each other and that we have uh, to invest more in defence. Um, and uh, and uh, and uh, and uh, European allies are are stepping up, uh, but we have to also understand that the United States is committed to NATO and to European security, not only in words but also in deeds, because after the end of the Cold War. The United States reduced their military presence in Europe, which was a natural thing to do after the end of the Cold War, the, the end of the Warsaw Pact and, and tensions went down. The last American battle tank left Europe in December 2013. Now the United States is back with a full armoured brigade, many battle tanks. There are more US soldiers, more US prepositioned equipment, more US investments in infrastructure now than it was that it has been for many, many, many years. So I, I, can, I cannot think about any stronger expression of US commitment to NATO and to European security than the fact that they are sending more US soldiers to Europe. Uh, and, uh, and therefore I'm, I'm, I'm not underestimating the differences and the challenges we have. 
But when it comes to, again, the core responsibility of NATO, we see that European allies and uh, North America are doing more together than we have done for many years. Uh, uh, European allies are investing more and the US is increasing their presence in uh, Europe. One president who is certainly focused on NATO is President Putin. What is your sense of what President Putin is trying to achieve in Europe and what, what, what does he want to do to NATO, do you think? So I think that uh, the goal of Russia and the goal of President Trump, uh, Putin is to re-establish a system uh, where you have some kind of spheres of influence, where big powers and then Russia can uh, decide or at least have a big say or what neighbours do or uh, don't do. Uh, and that's extremely dangerous uh, because that, that's the system where actually small uh, nations are not really independent, are not really sovereign. Uh, and, uh, and, and that system has led to wars many times in Europe. So uh, the whole idea that, that Russia has the right to decide what neighbours can do uh, is, is dangerous and it violates some absolutely fundamental principles uh, which NATO believes in. Um, but I think that uh, uh, they dislike the idea of having neighbours that do what they want. Especially because the neighbours then want to join NATO if they when they can do what they want, uh, and that's the reason why he 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 as a Russia is as a, has been responsible for aggressive actions against Ukraine, against uh, Georgia. Uh, they have Russian troops in Moldova, uh, and also why they dislike the fact that, for instance, the Baltic countries, Poland, have uh, joined uh, uh, NATO. Uh, our answer is that uh, is that we don't so we, that's not acceptable, and that's also the reason why we have so strongly uh, conveyed the message to Russia that uh, all European nations have the same right to choose their own path, including what kind of security arrangements they want to be part of. And over the last years, we have been able to invite two new uh, European countries to become members of NATO. Montenegro and uh, North Macedonia. Uh, Russia don't like that, uh, but, uh, uh, well, they don't decide. It's up to Montenegro and NATO allies to decide, and North Macedonia and NATO allies to decide, and we have decided that they, they are welcome to NATO and they have uh, joined NATO. One of the big discontinuities in Europe in recent years has been the British people deciding to exit the European Union. Will Brexit have an impact, do you think, on either on the British commitment to NATO or the, the, role that the, the historic role that the British plays as a key Western country, an outward-looking country that's able to project its power and its influence? Brexit will change UK's relationship to the European Union. Brexit will not change uh, the United Kingdom's relationship uh, to NATO. Um, if anything, I think uh, the UK commitment to NATO will just increase. Uh, uh, because it will be even more important for the United Kingdom to show that, well, they leave the European Union uh, in, with or without a deal. Uh, but that doesn't mean that they're not they're leaving the international community. And then NATO will become an even more important platform for uh, uh, UK to engage uh, with other countries and to bring uh, European allies uh, together. Uh, because then EU will not be that platform for UK, but uh, uh, NATO will be that platform. And UK is uh, the biggest defence spender in Europe uh, and the second largest in uh, the whole alliance. So it matters what UK does. And, uh, and, um, and therefore, uh, so Brexit will not change uh, anything when it comes to the relationship to, uh, to NATO. If anything, it will strengthen the importance and the relevance of, uh, of uh, NATO. Uh, that, that was the first question. The second I have forgotten, but that will, I think I answered. Yeah. All right. Let, let me bring you closer to this part of the world. Yeah. Um, also in Asia, just like in Europe, you have an order that has existed for, since the Second World War, but you have uh, one, an, a number of powers that are seeking to change that order, and in particular you have, you have China that is, um, some people would say, is seeking to, to become the dominant power in Asia, certainly doesn't subscribe to everything that Western countries say about the rules-based order in Asia. It's different from Russia because it's larger, it's richer, uh, its, its future is, is brighter, I think, than, than Russia's future. Uh, as a visitor to Asia, um, what, 
what do you, what, how would you diagnose China's intentions? Um, how, what would be your advice to a country like Australia that is trying to balance a deep economic relationship with China, but at the same time is a Western country, a treaty ally of the United States? So first of all, I'm very careful giving advice to uh, Australia. Uh, I concentrate on the 29 members I have, uh, and uh, and uh, that's uh, enough uh, for me. Uh, 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 second, I think that I think that uh, uh, I, I think that what matters for NATO now is that we strengthen the partnership with Australia and the rise of and also New Zealand and other and other partners of NATO in this region, also or. Asia-Pacific region, which includes also uh, our close partners Japan and South Korea, uh, uh, and that the rise of China makes that even more important. Uh, um, uh, because as you have already alluded to, there, the rise of China provides us with opportunities. The economic growth of China has been important for all of us. Uh, uh, it has helped, it alleviated a lot of poverty in China and it has uh, fueled growth in, in our own countries and we should welcome that. Uh, but at the same time, uh, we see that there are obvious challenges related to uh, the rise of the military power of uh, China. And, uh, and of course, you are closer to China than uh, uh, European uh, NATO allies are. Uh, and traditionally, NATO has been focused on the Soviet Union during the Cold War and Russia after that. But what we see is that uh, uh, the rise of China is having an an impact on our security, uh, partly because China is coming closer. We see them in uh, the Arctic, we see them in, Af in Africa, uh, we see them uh, investing heavily in critical infrastructure, also in, uh, in Europe, um, we see them in cyberspace, um, and we also see that uh, uh, decisions and, uh, by China and, 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 uh, and Chinese investments in new modern military capabilities have direct consequences for us. Uh, perhaps the, the most recent example is the demise of the INF Treaty. Because one of the reasons why Russia started to violate the INF Treaty, and, that, and the INF Treaty was really, has been a cornerstone for arms control in Europe for decades. Uh, it didn't reduce the number of intermediate range missiles, it banned all of them, eliminated the whole category of weapons, extremely important for our security. Uh, one of the reasons why uh, Russia started to uh, violate that treaty and deploy new intermediate range missiles in Russia, also, as I say, able to reach Europe but also other parts of the world, was that China had developed these kind of weapons and deployed many of them. China was not or is not bound by the INF Treaty. Uh, so the deployment of Chinese weapons triggered the deployment, or at least contributed to the deployment of similar weapons in Russia, which then uh, 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 led to the demise of the INF Treaty with direct impact on us. So, so great power competition is global, affects us all. Uh, I mentioned terrorism and cyber, two global challenges affects us all. So, so that makes it e even more important that, than we, that we work together. And that's exactly what I've discussed here uh, during my visit to Australia, but also uh, when I earlier the week uh, in the week uh, visited uh, uh, New Zealand. So, so I think it's up to Australia to decide what you do. But I really hope that you, uh, and 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 I don't only hope because that's an expressed uh, uh, wish from Australia is to work closer with NATO to deal with some of these uh, global challenges, including the rise of China. And just one more question on that front: Do you think that European nations are really seeing? take a three-dimensional view of China and understand the security challenges as well as the economic opportunities? Because often in Australia, I mean, our history is, of, uh, is often trying to contribute to the rules-based order in Europe from the First World War to the Second World War, but often it feels here that European countries see the economic upside of dealing with China, especially given economic difficulties in Europe, but are not so quick to see the challenges to the international order that China presents. I think that maybe that was right before, but I think that more and more European allies are aware of the different dimensions of the uh, rise of uh, China, uh, including the challenges. And uh, one thing that reflects that is that in NATO we have now started a more systematic work uh, on analysing and assessing the uh, security consequences. 
uh, and the challenges. So, uh, so uh, uh, yeah. So I think, and 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 just the fact that we are looking into what more we can do with partners in this region uh, also reflects that. That, uh, and again, it is in your interest and our interest that, that we work uh, uh, together. Uh, let me just also add that. Last time I visited uh, Australia was in 2011, then I went to the war memorial in Canberra. And to be honest, I should have known that before, but I, I'm an example of the many Europeans that have not been fully aware of how much you contributed to, uh, uh, so to, to, to our freedom, both in the First and the Second World War, World War and especially the First World War. And I think it's ex extremely important that we express the gratitude to Australia because one thing is to participate in the Second and the First World War if you are also already part of it or a European country, but you were actually sending people around the whole, on, to the other side of the world, and you suffered a lot uh, uh, to help us uh, uh, so gain uh, the freedom or, or, or maintain our freedom. So. So that's, that's, that, that's a lesson I learned when I was here the last time, and I feel a bit ashamed that I was not aware of that before I came. All right, well, thank you for that very nice, very generous comment. Let me, take, let me go to the audience for questions. We have about 20 minutes for questions, so please, uh, if someone would like to put a question to the Secretary General, please put up your hand, catch my eye. I'm sure that a, a flurry of hands is going to appear and like clockwork. I'm going to go first to Deborah Snow. Um, Deborah, if you and other questioners can wait for the microphone, if you can tell us your affiliation before you put your question and then keep your question brief if you don't mind. Thank you. Deborah Snow from the uh, Sydney Morning Herald and The Age, uh, Secretary General, thanks for your very interesting speech. Um, I was looking uh, just before you spoke uh, at a Time magazine article from earlier this year and it quoted um, former Kremlin advisor Sergei uh, Karaganov saying that history could have looked different. By not allowing Russia to join NATO, he, he said this was one of the worst mistakes in political history. It automatically put Russia and the West on a collision course, eventually sacrificing Ukraine. Um, that's, he's not alone in thinking that NATO was perhaps um, I won't say reckless, but hadn't thought through the consequences of allowing the Baltic states to uh, to join it in the wake of the dissolution of the former Soviet Union. So I'd like to get your response on that, please. Uh, so, that it was re reckless to allow the Baltic states to join NATO? There, there are those analysts yeah, who yeah, say yeah, 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 that promises yeah. were made, yes, Yeltsin yeah. has well, claimed, yeah, okay, that the promises were made that that, in, yeah. that would well, not so, yeah, happen. Yeah. I understand. You, you well, understand the history. Yeah. First, yeah, but first of all, no, no such premise was made. And second, just the idea that... Uh, that uh, also first of all, if NATO was going to make such a promise, then we need... Uh, at that time, I think we were 16 members uh, of NATO, then all 16 members have to sit in the meeting and agree. And I can absolutely assure you, guarantee you, that that meeting has never taken place. Uh, so there's been no guarantee from NATO. Uh, and the only way to make decisions in NATO is to buy consensus. So, of course, no, no such decision, no such promise to, to Russia that, that uh, after the end of the Cold War, after the, 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 the end of the Warsaw Pact, that uh, the former uh, Warsaw Pact members or uh, republics in the Soviet Union uh, should uh, so not be allowed to, to, uh, to join NATO. Uh, but the, but the, another version of the same uh, uh, as a, as a, uh, uh, as a idea is that, is that uh, this was a promise made by, for instance, the United States. That's also wrong. Uh, but second, if that had taken place, it would, be, it would have been absolutely unacceptable. Because the idea that, in a way, the United States or any other country in NATO should promise on behalf of other sovereign European nations, what they can do, is actually violating their sovereign right to choose their own path. So how can... That's, that, that's to re-establish the idea of uh, great powers, big powers, deciding what small powers can do. Uh, uh, and, and, and the whole idea of that, I am a big power, so I deny you to do this or that. Uh, and, that's, and that's absolutely against everything I believe in. 
I believe in the sovereign right of every, every nation to make their own decisions, uh, including uh, uh, what kind of security arrangements or military alliance they would like to join or not join. So if, if we, as we have good friends and partners like uh, Sweden and Finland, they have decided to not join NATO, and I fully respect that. As I respect the Baltic countries to the, that decide to, that they wanted to join. And of course, Russia has no right to deny Latvia to join NATO. If Latvia, through democratic processes, comes to the conclusion they would like to join NATO, it's for them to decide and then for the NATO members to see if they meet the NATO standards. Not for Russia to say that's a provocation. And I use very often an example that if, if, if we accept that thinking, then how can Norway be a member of NATO? We are a small uh, uh, country uh, uh, bordering Russia, and I know, as I was not born then in 1949, but, 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 but then, of course, Joseph Stalin, who was the boss in, in Russia and the Soviet Union, he really disliked that Norway joined NATO. But I'm very glad that uh, uh, the British government and the American government and uh, Truman and Clement Attlee and all the others, they said, no, Norway is welcome to NATO despite the fact that we are a border country of, uh, of Russia. So, uh, first of all, it is wrong that such promises were made, and if they were made, it would have been wrong. So this is twice wrong, if you understand what I mean. Uh, and therefore, uh, yeah, uh, I believe in the right of every nation to decide their own path, uh, and, uh, and, uh, and, uh, and that's what the NATO is uh, uh, pursuing. I saw Hervé Lemichur from the Lowy Institute. Thank you, Secretary General. Um, Hervé Lemichur from the Lowy Institute. Um, another area where Australia and NATO have worked uh, together on is in the reconstruction of Afghanistan. And that has been an enormous effort, has cost the lives of both NATO soldiers and Australian soldiers. Australia dedicates $80 million a year on Afghanistan's uh, post-reconstruction building. Um, and yet, President Trump is now negotiating with the Taliban and has hinted towards uh, withdrawing the troops that remain in Afghanistan. How do you feel the peace process is going? And is this not reneging on the commitment which you made, uh, which is to tackle international terrorism? Um, first, I would like to express my uh, gratitude to Australia for uh, participating, contributing to the NATO uh, mission presence in Afghanistan over many years and also pay tribute to uh, those who have uh, paid the ultimate price uh, and, uh, and express my condolences to all the, those who have lost loved ones, family members and, and, and Australia has paid the high price. Um, uh, as other NATO allies and partners have in Afghanistan. Uh, then we have to remember why we went into Afghanistan. We went into Afghanistan because Afghanistan uh, was a safe haven for international terrorists, a place where Al-Qaeda and other groups could plan, organize, train uh, uh, terrorist attacks on us after 9-11. Uh, and the main task purpose of our presence in Afghanistan has been to prevent Afghanistan from once again becoming uh, such a platform for international terrorism. There are many problems in Afghanistan. Uh, we see continued violence, we see, we see uh, uh, instability, we, we, there are uh, many, many challenges. Uh, but we have also seen some important progress. First of all, Afghanistan is not longer a safe haven for international terrorism. There are terrorists there, but they're not operating, or to say, in a free and safe environment. They are constantly under attack. Uh, second, we have helped, uh, 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 supported, enabled uh, in economic and social and political progress, um, uh, which has allowed millions of uh, young people to get education. Uh, during the Taliban era, there were no girls getting education at all, and now millions of girl, young girls are getting education. Um, um, uh, so the rights of women has made enormous, uh, enormous progress related to the, uh, to the rights and the role of women in Afghanistan. Uh, 
I welcome the fact that we now have a real peace talks going on. We are closer to a peace deal now than ever before. Um, uh, Ambassador Khal is out of the, the negotiator uh, 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 from the American side, is closely consulting with uh, all NATO allies and partners because we went in together and we have made clear that we will make a decision of a future presence of you in Afghanistan together. And when the time is right, we will also then leave uh, uh, together. Uh, what is important is that, is that a deal preserve the gains we have made, meaning that it's important that we have a deal that preserve uh, that Afghanistan uh, doesn't once again become a safe haven for international terrorism and that we also create the best possible framework to preserving the social and economic progress we have made, especially for when it comes to the rights of uh, women. I cannot tell you anything exactly about when there will be or if or when or if there will be an agreement because negotiations are difficult and nothing is agreed before everything is agreed. But but the, we are closer uh, uh, to a deal now than we have been ever before, and we have to remember that NATO is there uh, to um, to create the conditions for peace, meaning that Taliban has to understand that they will never win on the battlefield. Uh, so they have to sit down at the negotiating table and now they're actually sitting down at the negotiating table and hopefully that will lead to something that will uh, create a situation in Afghanistan uh, where uh, uh, we um, uh, are able to reduce our presence uh, without uh, risking uh, the gains we have made uh, related to the fight against terrorism and the social and economic progress. All right, who else would like to ask a question? Yes, I saw this gentleman in the middle. Yes. Desmond Woods, Royal Australian Navy. Uh, during the Cold War, there were only two NATO countries that had borders directly with the Soviet Union, your own and Turkey. And Turkey was the reliable southern bastion of NATO. President Erdogan's rhetoric suggests that he sees Turkey as semi-detached from NATO. Uh, and. Uh, we know that there's a considerable dispute currently over the arrival of F-35 Joint Strike Fighters and Soviet missiles capable of shooting them down in Turkey. And this is quite a standoff going on. Uh, how reliable do you regard Turkey's current and future membership of NATO? The, 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 the Turkish decision to acquire uh, S-400, the Russian air defense system, uh, um, it's a national sovereign decision by Turkey, but I am concerned about the consequences of that uh, decision. Uh, it, 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 in NATO, it is a national decision what kind of systems different nations uh, buy or acquire. Uh, but what matters for NATO is uh, interoperability, that it can be, that they can operate together. And of course, a Russian uh, air defense system, S-400, will not be integrated uh, into the NATO integrated air and missile defense. Uh, and as you uh, mentioned, uh, uh, there are also consequences for the delivery of the F-35, F the, the fighter uh, aircraft, and, uh, and, and therefore I'm concerned about the consequences. Um, having said that, I welcome the fact that the United States and Turkey are talking uh, together uh, on the possibility of uh, a U.S. delivery of a, a U.S. system, a Patriot system. Uh, there are also talks uh, between Turkey and uh, Italy and, uh, and France on a possible delivery of a French-Italian system, uh, air defense system called SAMT. And we have to remember that NATO is already augmenting the air defenses of uh, Turkey with the deployment of uh, two air defense batteries, uh, one SAMT and one uh, Patriot battery in uh, Turkey. Um, uh, again, I'm not, uh, the, the S-400 issue is a serious issue, but Turkey's contributions, Turkey's role in NATO runs much deeper than the issue of S-400. Uh, even though that's the important uh, Turkish contribution is much more than that. Uh, uh, and not least in the fight against terrorism. We have to remember that as a, some months ago, uh, 
a couple of years ago, uh, 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 Daesh, ISIS, uh, controlled a territory as big as the United Kingdom, as I said. They were threatening Baghdad, uh, uh, and, and now they have lost all the territory they controlled. Uh, that has been possible, not least because we have been able to work with our NATO ally, Turkey, in attacking uh, ISIS uh, in Iraq and Syria. Uh, Turkish infrastructure, uh, uh, the fact that we were able to control the border, all that has been extremely important. So when it comes to uh, uh, the fight against terrorism, uh, Turkey is an extremely uh, important ally. Uh, so, yes, it is a problem. I am concerned about the consequences of the S-400, uh, but I am absolutely certain that Turkey will remain uh, a, a, a highly valued and important NATO ally, uh, and, uh, and we will address a lot of other challenges together with Turkey, uh, despite the fact that the S-400 is creating some uh, problems. We have time for a couple more questions. I saw this gentleman over here on, on the edge. Thank you very much. Uh, Anthony Zui, I work on development at the University of New South Wales. And while I understand that NATO is primarily focused on uh, hard power and security in relation to um, military security, I was wondering if you could say something about some of the other things that you've referred to, uh, issues like climate change, issues like the Belt and Road Initiative, maybe also thinking about the importance of um, uh, development assistance, and how, for a country like Australia, one should be thinking about the balances between these different forms of power. So the last question was, the last issue. How, how do you balance the different kinds of power, soft oh, power, oh, hard oh, power? Oh. Uh, so first of all, I think we, we, uh, we have to understand that, that uh, NATO is the answer to many problems, but NATO is not the answer to all problems. Uh, uh, so we have different tools, different institutions, different multinational institutions and organizations addressing different challenges. And I'm very proud of NATO, and, and, and NATO has been the most successful uh, alliance in the history, and we have uh, achieved our main uh, uh, task, uh, our main goal, and that is to uh, keep uh, uh, peace, uh, preserve the peace in Europe. And that's not a small task, uh, because we have, uh, as a, uh, we have an unprecedented period of peace in Europe uh, since NATO was established. Uh, that's not only because of NATO, but uh, the establishment of NATO has been key to uh, maintain peace in Europe. We have to remember that the kind of n the normal situation in Europe before was that we were uh, so at war, uh, and at least it was very. Hard. It's hard to find in the history of Europe, at least for that part of Europe which is a member of uh, of NATO, any period as long as the period we have seen since the Second World War, which has been peaceful. I sometimes refer to my own part of Europe, uh, the Nordic countries. We used to fight each other all the time. That was the normal thing Swedes and Danes and uh, Norwegians uh, did was to fight. Uh, and, and, and French, also France and Germany. Uh, you, Europe is full of conflicts. It's kind of the Middle East, uh, based on et uh, ethnic divisions, religious divisions, political divisions. We were fighting each other uh, almost all the time. Now we live at peace. Uh, so, so I say this just to, to say that it's not a small thing. It's not a minor issue to maintain peace. That's a big thing. And NATO has been key, uh, essential to do exactly that. Then I agree that there are many other issues which are extremely important. For instance, fighting poverty, alleviating poverty, promoting economic growth, uh, uh, dealing with climate change. And in my previous uh, uh, political life uh, uh, as a Norwegian politician, uh, actually I was more uh, engage in those issues than <laughs> defense and security, but I, I ended up in NATO. So uh, then I thought it was time to also focus on defense and security. Um, uh, uh, but of course there, there are there are there are links. Uh, uh, climate change uh, can fuel conflicts, can create, uh, also can, can 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 force many people to move, and that and that can create uh, conflicts. Um, uh, poverty can create conflicts. So, of course, the more progress we are able to make in the fight against poverty, the more economic development we are able to create, 
uh, the easier it is also to uh, to create a peaceful and stable uh, uh, international uh, environment. And and uh, and uh, climate change, uh, of course, uh, are we able? Are if we are successful in dealing with climate change, we are also helping to under peace, peace and uh, stability. Uh, but my answer is in a way that NATO is not the tool to deal with climate change. There are all the, the Paris Accord, the, the UN efforts, that's the platform to deal with that. Uh, and, uh, and NATO is not a development aid agency. Uh, we are important for, for, for uh, prosperity because without peace and stability, you're not able to create prosperity. And if you look at the, the list of you know, the, the least developed countries in the world, what characterizes them is that there is war, conflict. So a kind of first step to create prosperity, economic development, is to create peace. And, and, and NATO helps to do that. Uh, but then there are many other efforts which has to be done by others. So I don't know whether I really answered your question, but I'm saying that, yes, these are important uh, efforts, but, but I think NATO's, not, uh, NATO's task is to maintain peace and then uh, we need to use other uh, tools in national institutions to address the other challenges. You've got enough on your plate, <laughs> is, what, is what you're saying, Secretary yeah. General. We'll take one more question before we, before we finish up. All right, this, this gentleman here, if you could wait for the microphone, sir. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, Paul Hatfield, um, private citizen, no affiliations. That's allowed. Uh, <laughs> um, the United States was one of the original founding members of NATO in, in 1949, when there was only 48 states. And Hawaii didn't become a state of America until 1959. And Hawaii has never been a signatory to NATO, and today is separate. Therefore, if there was an attack on Hawaii, even though America is a signatory and a member of NATO, NATO couldn't do anything. It's my understanding that NATO couldn't do anything. All right, that's a very technical question. No. Thank you, sir. No, so if one ally is attacked and uh, Hawaii is part of uh, the United States, which is part of uh, NATO, uh, then uh, uh, Article 5 uh, of the uh, North Atlantic Treaty states clearly that that should be regarded as an attack on us all and we can trigger Article 5. Uh, so, uh, so that's in a way the answer to that. Having said that, I think that we have to understand that at the end of the day, this is a political issue. Uh, uh, meaning that, 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 that at the end of the day, this is about a political commitment that we are standing up for each other. And just to have the idea uh, that, that one ally should be attacked and then we are we not reacting will undermine the credibility of the whole of NATO. And therefore, it's, I think it's also quite interesting to, also to, 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 to think about or reflect about the fact that those who wrote the Warship Treaty back in 1949, I think when they wrote the Article 5, the idea was to protect an European NATO allies against attack from the Soviet Union. We never evoked Article 5 uh, 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 addressing the Soviet Union because the Soviet Union never attacked us because we had credible deterrence. They knew that if they attacked one ally, it would trigger the whole response, the response for the whole alliance, and that prevented the conflict. So it is a paradox that the first time we invoked Article 5 was after an attack on the United States, by a terrorist organization, by Al-Qaeda. And, and again, I, it's not easy to ask those who wrote the article uh, back in 49, but I, I guess none of them have thought about the idea that the first and only time we invoked that article was after an attack by a terrorist organization on the United States. So I think the Hawaiians can rest easy. Mm. Um, I'm going to, uh, because I don't want to finish on that point, I'm going to ask you one final question, Secretary General. You mentioned, I, I mentioned in the introduction that you're a, uh, you're a national politician, you're a prime minister, um, and you mentioned in your answer to the last question on climate change and the BRI that, that you deal with very different issues as the head of an alliance. Um, and now you're focused on defence and military issues. Can I ask you to reflect a bit more broadly on the differences between being a national leader and being the leader of an alliance, um, especially in the context of a world in which uh, a lot of Western countries, there seems to be distrust of international organisations and, 
and Davos Man and, and, and so on. What, what have you found, uh, which of the roles have you found more satisfying? How are they, how are they similar and different? Do you feel that, 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 that one can do good work at the international level as well as the national level? There are many similarities and many differences. Uh, uh, one uh, uh, big difference is that, at least when you are prime minister, you are responsible for many different things. As you were one as in the morning, you work with the, on education, and then on health, and then on transportation, and then on climate change, and then on defence and security, and then, and then, uh, yeah, to deal with the challenges in the parliament and and so on. So it's, it's a broad range of issues uh, all the time mixed together. Uh, uh, and now, uh, as Secretary General of NATO, I'm focused on one uh, so set of topics, uh, uh, security, defense. Uh, 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 so that's, that's a difference. Um, um, then there are, um, uh, yeah, and then another difference is that, it, 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 I have to be honest and say that it's sometimes easier to, to see the link between a decision when you're a national politician and, uh, what should I say, the result. Mm -hmm. We build a hospital, the hospital stands there and uh, we can cut the ribbon and everyone applauds and everyone is happy. <laughs> it's less of that uh, in uh, international politics. It's a more process, it takes time. Uh, but at the same time, when we are able to agree, when we're able to do something, it's, it's really of great importance. So I'm extremely proud of what we have been able to achieve in NATO. Uh, the biggest adaptation, the biggest reinforcement of NATO since the, uh, since the end of the Cold War in a generation. Uh, if anyone had told me uh, or that we were able to have combat-ready troops, thousands of troops, uh, combat-ready troops in the Eastern part of the Alliance, uh, uh, told me that in 2015, I would say that will be highly unlikely. Now we have that. Uh, 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 we have tripled the size of the NATO response force. Uh, uh, and, uh, and, uh, and just the fact that we were cutting defence budgets, now we are increasing with billions. You can like it or, or, or not like it, but, but that's, that's huge differences. And it's hard to imagine anything more important than preserving the peace. So I, I, I am, I'm, I'm, I'm happy when I go to bed, feeling that I have a meaningful uh, uh, job. But it's, it's sometimes easy to... Yeah, you make a decision one day uh, in the budget of Norway and then you have the road uh, at least uh, yeah, not so long after that. Uh, 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 then, then, then there are similarities. Um, uh, one similarity is that you need, you need to negotiate, you need to make compromises. Uh, perhaps that's a bit different in, uh, in, in Australia, but at least in most European countries, including Norway, we have different kind of coalition or minority governments. So you always have to sit down with some other parties and find some solutions. And to be honest, that I've never participated in any more difficult negotiations than when you negotiate, for instance, budgets in Norway. So there is no diplomatic or international negotiation which is in any way as hard <laughs> than to agree on exactly how many money we're going to spend on that right. road compared to that road or that hospital or whatever it is. So, you so should see, you should see the budget negotiations at the Lowy Institute, yeah, yeah, Secretary maybe, General. Maybe. <laughs> so, so, and and I think that's actually a valuable experience to have in NATO uh, to know how to find compromises. And at the end of the day, we need compromises. Compromise is not a bad thing. Compromise is a good thing. That's a way to find a solution to uh, to be able to, to to come to conclusion and to make decisions both on the national level and on the international level. Well, ladies and gentlemen, that's all we have time for. I want to thank you for very much for joining us tonight, Mr Secretary-General. We've seen all of your sincerity and passion on display tonight. Every day, it seems, the liberal international order is less liberal and less international and less orderly. And at times like that, we need organisations like NATO to keep the international system orderly. So thank you very much. Thank you for visiting Australia. Thank you for your speech. Thank you for the work that you do on, on behalf of the organisation. So, ladies and gentlemen, please join me in thanking <laughs> the